Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Whaley's Chapel. It's so good to see you all here. If you all stand and join me, we'll sing See Me Through It. Things are getting real. Jesus, take the wheel. Only way I'm getting to the other side. Days are getting dark. Life's a little hard, blinding, but I'm trying not to lose sight. I don't got this, I know you got this, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe it before I see it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're gonna see me through it. If anybody can, you can do it. God, I know in the trouble, in the pain, fire in the rain, you're gonna see me through it. You're gonna see me through it. If anybody can, you can do it. God falls, who am I gonna call? The one who put it up there in the first place. Full scale attack, devil on my back, better lace him up and go put on my game face. I don't got this, I know you got this, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe it before I see it, yeah, yeah. I know you're gonna see me through it. If anybody can, you can do it. God, I know in the trouble. Has anybody had a birthday since last Sunday? All right, what about anniversaries? Has anybody had an anniversary since last Sunday? No anniversaries? Now on to our announcements. Our pantry items for the month of July are white vinegar and egg noodles, as well as combs, brushes, and alcohol-free mouthwash. And then our jobs for children's church today, and that is for ages six and younger. And our jobs for children's church for the remainder of the month. All right, and this afternoon and evening, we have children's music practice starting at 5, followed by Layman's League and Women's Auxiliary at 6. Then Wednesday night, Bible study at 7, and choir practice at 8. Please come out and join us for that. Then next Sunday, Dr. Ed Kroom from the University of Mount Olive will be here for morning worship. And then for our evening worship service, the Reverend Craig Simmons will be here, and we will have communion and feet washing next Sunday evening. Are there any other announcements? Yes, Hannah, I have two or three. There will be no children's church this morning. Um, I think maybe the only one is Ada. So it will be good to still have children's stuff that the kids want to bring up. And also, um, you can text message me. I, I made this announcement in praise and worship. I'm having a lot of trouble when people respond back to the group text going out. What I need for you to do is stop doing that. If you want to say something, individually send it to me alone. <coughs> What's happening, it's not consistent with the same group. I have seven groups of 20 people I'm sending this out to, and it's dropping my groups, and I'm having to re-type them in and everything. And it's not a big aggravation, but I'm telling you what, this past week's been very busy with the text messages. 
and everyone I sent out it had to do at least one or two groups again. So, and we are working on something, but just don't respond. We know you're praying. We know you're caring. If you need information, either call me or whatever, because I'm not putting everything out there that goes on because the families don't want everything out there. They want your prayers. And I also want to make mention and thank um, Wendy and Rhonda's families for last month's pool party. And I want to thank Gene and Bunny and Jason for this past Monday night's pool party. And if you don't understand how much fun we have, just pay attention to this video and see if you can figure out who this is. <laughs> Can you up. imagine this is a potential minister? <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have fun, buddy. You gotta have fun. 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 You gotta have All right, if everyone will stand and join me and turn in your hymn books to page 319, we'll sing Jesus Loves Even Me. section this upcoming Wednesday. Um, Cindy Martin, she has a terminal lung disease and it's progressing very fast. Cindy Martin. Yes, ma'am. The Runyon family, my first cousin passed away yesterday. The Runyon family. <coughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, Jim Shue. Jim Shue. Hugh. Gotcha. Jim Hugh. Mr. G. Yes, my father is uh, doing much better now in Tarboro, in the, in, the, in the home he's in, the rehabilitation home. They have called in hospice 
to give him more one-on-one -on -one attention, and it seems to really be helping. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, let's continue to remember Marlene Andrews and also Maggie, the small infant from Juniper Chapel, and Michael Berry. And also I ask prayer for the highway patrolmen that have run over the gentleman in Beulahville, somewhere around the IGA this past week, Andrew Westmoreland. Remember he and his family as well as the family of the gentleman that passed away. Any others? Remember Miss Gail, she's fighting vertigo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if there are no others, raise your hands for silent requests and Mr. Jody. Uh, another praise. Um, Thursday, Noah had an interview with Liberty Christian Academy to try to, you know, we figured that that environment would be more in tune with his, uh, you know, his personality, I put it that way. He doesn't want to get lost in all the hustle and bustle of a big high school, and we wanted that type of, you know, kind of lower environment for him, but he did get accepted into, into Liberty Christian, so we're, we're, uh, we're thankful for that, and, and, he had a one-on-one -on -one interview with the, the high school principal, and, and uh, he, he comes walking out from his interview, and he was kind of like, well, I, I guess it went okay. Maybe it was all right. I'm like, he's about like me whenever it comes to asking a bunch of questions and stuff. Once the interview's over with, you don't know what was asked or what your answers were. It was all that. So that all, that, all that information was left at liberty, but we're, we're praising the Lord for that, and, and we're looking forward to, uh, to his time there. So, um, Andrew Westmoreland, the trooper that was that was involved in that accident, and uh, his dad, Charles Westmoreland, used to be an employee for many, many, many years at Jones Onslow, and um, so they they were you know just keep that family in your prayers. So they're good folks, and and I know it's it's tough for both sides of, of the house, the ones who were um, involved in it, and as, as well as uh, Trooper Westmoreland. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you once again for the honor and the opportunity to come into your house this morning, to be in your presence, Father. Your Holy Spirit is dwelling within each and every one of us today, and, and we just thank you for being able to come here and to, and to fellowship one with another and, and to commune with you, Father, and, and just to lift up these praises and these, these songs to you and these, these thanks, uh, hearts of thanksgiving, Father, that we have. And uh, we just turn everything over to you, Father. We just give you the praise and the honor and the glory for everything. Father, we've had many prayer requests this morning, the ones who are, are awaiting test results, those who are, are recovering from surgeries and medical procedures, Father. Father, we just thank you for getting these people through those procedures, and, and just get, we, we pray that, that, uh, that your will will be done in each and every situation. These people will get a clean bill of health and be able to get back to their normal lives, Father. For those who are bereaved this, this morning, Father, just lift down, reach down and, and lift up the families and, and uh, just give them uh, peace and comfort. And uh, just just touch them in, in a way that only you can, Father, as you are the great healer and a great physician and a great comforter, Father. We just thank you for that. And we just turn these people over to you right now, Father. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, this morning, Father, the sacrifice that he made on that cross, the blood that he shed that, that covered all of our sins, Father, because there's there's way too many for us to count and there's way too many for, for uh, to, that we don't want to look at, Father, because they're so bad sometimes. And But your son's blood covered every single one of them, Father. And, and through that blood, through that sacrifice, his death and resurrection, that we, we have the promise of eternal life if we will just turn to you and just believe in him, Father. That if there's anybody here today that does, does not you know you as their, as their personal Savior, Father, I, I pray that today will be the day of salvation, that they will turn to you before it's eternally too late, Father. Father, we just turn this service over to you to have your will and your way. Just bless each and every one that's come here today, Father, and just we, we thank you and give you the praise and the honor and the glory for all that's accomplished. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 All right, if you'll stand and join me once again and turn your hymn books to page 363, we'll sing The Lily of the Valley. <laughs>
I know, I know. Um, I can see that. I can see. Red Sea. I get it. No, that's not what I was getting at. Well, I'm ready for the questions. Fire away. All right, so do you remember about Moses and the Red Sea? I remember that people of God were scared. Uh, why was that? Because thousands of their enemies were chasing after them with more than sticks and stones. Sticks and stones will break my bones. I get it, yeah. That's enough to be scared, but they wanted to do more than just hurt them. That's right. So, and they couldn't go any further at one point. Why was that? Because they were met with the sea, <laughs> the Red Sea. Um, why were they afraid? The enemy was approaching. Yes, and? And there were a lot of them, and they had no way to protect themselves. All right, go on, <clears throat> and? And the water was deep. And? They had no boats or rafts to get across the <clears throat> <laughs> to get across the sea with. Um, would you be afraid? Um, well, duh. Yeah, sure. Of course I would be. All right. So, but shouldn't they have been afraid? Well, I'm not following you. Uh, good answer. So, the people of God were afraid too. And they were complaining to Moses like it was all his fault. Well, he was the leader, right? The one to follow the one to follow was God. And they were very nervous right about now. So they heard the horses and the clang clanging of the soldier swords and the shields. I would have been scared. So what happened? Do you remember the story? God got involved. All right. So he always does. And, um, you know, he's always got our back. I know we can count on that. So what happened? I guess you want me to answer this one too, huh? Yep, sure do. I guess you do. Uh, Moses gave the command, and Aaron lifted up the rod that God gave them, and God brought a great wind that parted the Red Sea like an open book. And then what? They crossed the sea. And? And they got to the other side. And? And you're going to make me do all the talking, and they were safe. Then what? And they were safe. Okay, so um, is that the end of the story? You tell me. Nope, it is not. So... God brought them to the other side, but the danger was still behind them. Oh, yeah. The soldiers were still coming, and the water was still parted. Then what happened? God brought the water down on the enemy. And what does this teach you? To trust God and not be afraid. That's right. So, no matter what trouble you are in, God will help you. I must tell you, I would have been very scared going through the Red Sea. I'm sure they were, too, but God protected them. And I would have been scared when I saw the soldiers coming after us. That's only natural. But I would always remember what God did when the water fell on the soldiers. 
And that's what God wanted his people to do, to remember where they came from and that they should sin no more. Just like us. Remember where we came from and sin no more. Good lesson. Thanks for helping with the lesson today. Oh, you're quite welcome. I think I did the lion's share talking. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, no matter how bad we think, do you think we'll ever run into anything in our life as scary as Egyptians chasing us across the Red Sea? Maybe not. I hope not. Right? But, so... If you can have, if they can have faith in God in that, then there should be no reason why we shouldn't have faith in God to get us through any problem that we have, right? Nothing will be as wide or as big as the Red Sea. It may seem like that for now, but but don't get me wrong. We can pray to God to help save us, but it doesn't mean we won't get in trouble for things, right? It just won't be as bad as if you didn't, right? Because we'll still get in trouble. Right? That doesn't, so don't think, I don't want any of y'all scheming and going back home like, hmm, I can do all these things my parents don't want me to do. I'll ask God for help, and he'll save me from any kind of wrath of my parents. That is not true. I tried it. <laughs> not true. He, ha he has made it, he has made it so I've learned a lesson. And then walk him walk away. That doesn't mean he won't absolve you from trouble. But give your troubles up to God, and he will see you through them. Amen. Every one of them. Guarantee it. Y'all ready? Don't try and practice that today, though. Give it a little bit of a break. Don't get in trouble today and see if God will help you. <laughs> Let it naturally kind of occur, okay? Don't test the water. No pun intended, all right? Y'all ready to go back and sit with the parents today? Oh, I know y'all are. I can see it. I can see it in your faces. So all right, kids. <laughs> I'm going to go stand over here for a minute. Uh, this is for later. This is, this is just an, an illustration for later. I'll let y'all let let sit around and, and, and try to figure out what this is and what it's for. And, you know. No, definitely not Santa Claus. It's... Uh, Sanford and Sons is probably more like it. Yeah, that's probably more like it. But uh, <laughs> um, so I was watching, uh, flipping through some reels on Facebook the other day, and usually if you see, it, it, there's so many different videos and stuff out there on Facebook, it's it's hard to catch the same one twice, especially in a course of like three or four days. Like usually once you see it once, it's gone. If you don't save it or you don't share it to somebody, it's gone. It's in the ether forever. It's gone. Well, I ran across a reel, a little video that deals with these trash bags, and it was an illustration that this pastor was using for his church. And um, I ran across it twice in three days. And I was like, oh, okay, so that's a, there's a unicorn. Wednesday night, Victor sent me, a uh, long text. It was after church. After I got home from church, he sent me a text, and it was about, you know, carrying around a, a lot of extra stuff in our in our in our backpack if we're hiking. You know, we want to make sure we don't run out of anything when we go somewhere. So I was like, okay, we're going to try to meld these two ideas together. But my sermon today is titled "Rest, Rest." And I said in, this, in Sunday school this morning, I said I'm casting a broad net this morning because everybody in here, no matter how old or young you are, needs rest. And um, our scripture text comes this morning from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I'm reading from the, all the scripture this morning is from the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version, and it reads, Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for your word. We ask now that you Take these words we're going to see, the, 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 the scriptures we're going to read this morning, and, and just lay these in our hearts so that we can take these words outside of these walls and we can share these ideas and these scriptures with other people that we may be a light unto you, Father, and, and to bring glory and honor to your name. Bless us all now as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, there... A lot of people that I know, myself included, have to constantly be busy. We have to constantly be doing something. We can't sit still. We don't like to sit still. We don't like to have any idle hands. We think the idle hands is the devil's workshop. It's what we've always heard. 
You know, if you're sitting around not doing anything, the devil's going to come up behind you and snatch you up and make you do something you don't, you're not supposed to do, right? And then, well, as we were little, I remember hearing that all the time. Well, that right there, having to constantly be busy, does what? It buries us under a lot of anxiety and worry and stress, right? It's, it's a personal reaction to being busy all the time, always doing something. Or how many of you are always having to, to your people pleasers? You've got, if anybody asks you to do something, you do it. I'll go ahead and raise my hand. I'm, I'm like that. My daddy was like that. My granddaddy was like that. Everybody, all the men that I know are like that in some way, form or fashion. And, but when you, when you start down that path of, of helping someone that needs help, it's funny how quickly they come back to you and need help again with something else, and it kind of keeps going and going and going. But you, you're so busy helping other people and doing other things that you don't have time to do your stuff that you need to do. That's what the problem we get into. I think Mama told us a story one time where our daddy was always helping other people after they moved their house over there to the back swamp, and it still had the Tyvek around the house. There was no siding on it because he hadn't had time to put the, the siding on because he was busy helping everybody else. So when we're busy like that, when we've always got something going on, we're always got our hands in something and doing things and moving around and, and stuff, we, our, our minds don't have time to shut down and rest. We can't see the things that are happening around us. We, can't, we, we, lose, we get tunnel vision, focusing on either one small thing we're working on or wide vision, seeing everything all at once, and we can't focus. That happens to me all the time. I do it all the time. We don't know how to slow down sometimes. We don't know how to rest. We don't know how to take a break. We don't know how to say no. Saying no is very empowering. If you don't know how to do that, you need to learn how to say no when the right time comes around. You can't say no to everybody, but you've got to learn how to say, you know what, I can't support that endeavor right now because I have all of this other stuff going on. But anyway, but how many times are we running around doing stuff that God has not told us to do? It's busy work is what it, it turns out to be. We're, we're involved in stuff that, that, we haven't, that we haven't sought God's direction on. We haven't asked God, is this something I need to spend my energy on? Is this stuff that I need to really be doing? Now, if you notice on your, if you've got an outline, there's a lot of scripture going over today. So we're going to kind of run through this as quickly as possible because there's, if, if you haven't noticed in the Bible, there's a lot of scripture, and this is just a small portion, that talks about rest. It talks about slowing down and stopping and taking time to rest. Um, but it, going back to you know not doing what God has called you to do or what something that He's involved in, Psalms 127 verses one and two says, "Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guards keep watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for He gives sleep to His beloved." So what's that saying is, it's not saying go out and quit your job, getting up early and going to bed late because you're, you're busy, you're doing all this stuff. It's not what Solomon was saying. What he's saying is if, if you're not seeking God's counsel or God's direction in anything that you're doing, then you may be doing it in vain. The builder that builds the house in vain, if the Lord's not helping him build the house. If the guards guard the city without the help of God, Without seeking God, if the, if the people are not doing what God has asked them to do, then they may be doing that work in vain. Sometimes we trust our abilities over what God has said we can do or what we're supposed to do. I ain't got to ask God to help with that. I can do that on my own. I don't have to ask his direction on that kind of stuff. I'm, I got it. We trust our own abilities. But our abilities, our our finances, our situations, our circumstances can change in an instant. When that does change, when that does happen, when we do hit that brick wall, so to speak, what do we do? We turn to God. And we're like, oh, man, I should have come to seek you in the beginning because what I did was in vain. What I did didn't help my situation. It actually made it worse. So now I'm having to dig myself out of this hole that I'm in. So are you asking God for direction? Are you asking him for guidance? Are you asking him to help you get through the things that you may or may not have to do? So how do you get rest? And I'm not just talking about physical rest, but we're going to talk about physical rest here in a second. Well, it's in our scripture verse. 
Jesus said, come to me. I will give you rest. He said, lay all your burdens down on me. Let me take care of you. Put on my yoke. My burden is light. I am kind-hearted. I'm not going to beat you with the whip. I'm not going to make you do the work that I won't help you do. I, if you just come hang out with me for a little bit and relax, spiritually rest, I will take care of it for you. So we got three points this morning. And um, the first one is uh, rest for peace. Rest gives us peace. When we rest, we can get physical and spiritual peace. Because when we're busy up doing all this kind of other stuff, we don't have time to actually have that peaceful mindset. So Proverbs 3, verse 24 says, If you sit down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. I'm grumpy when I don't get enough sleep. As a matter of fact, whenever I, no matter how much sleep I get, if, when I wake up in the morning, don't talk to me for an hour. Just leave me alone. Let me, by the time I get to work, I'm okay. <laughs> Stacy's like, whatever. <laughs> but she knows, we've been married for almost 20 years. She knows exactly how I am in the morning. I know how she is in the morning. And yet still, to this day, she will try to talk to me while I'm trying to get ready to go to work in the morning. I'm like, don't speak to me. <laughs> Call me whenever I get to work, whenever you get to work, or send me a text message or whatever. And I said, we'll, we'll walk through it. I said, but right now, I'm not, I'm not here. My body is in, is in a mode to do, to, I, go, I go get a shower, I get my stuff together, and I walk out the door and I go to work. I said, I'm on cruise control until about an hour after I, I get woken up. But anyway, or when you go to sleep, does your mind race? Do you have a hard time shutting your brain off? Oh, man. Yeah, I married one of those. I can, 99% of the time, as soon as my head hits the pillow, within two minutes, I'm gone. I'm in a coma. Until my alarm clock goes off seven or eight times, <clears throat> but there are times whenever I, when there are there are times whenever my brain does not want to quit. I've got some something heavy weighing on my mind. Something is haunting me spiritually. Something is just weighing on my heart heavy, and it just will not stop. It will just keep going and going and going and going and going. We talked about this in, at camp about you know one of the ways that we can kind of kind of tune that out a little bit as we start praying. Ms. Ruth said there's many times where she falls asleep praying to God at night because she can't get her brain to quit. And so the only way to do that is to come into the presence of God with prayer. Let him, he knows what's going on. He's waiting for you to say, okay, are you going to ask, ask for some help? Are you, gonna, are you just going to sit there and flounder and, and be mad at yourself because it's now 2 o'clock in the morning and you have to get up in about two hours, two or three hours to go to work? but you've gotten zero sleep because your mind has wandered all night long and just raced and gone back and forth and this and that instead of just saying, you know what, God, I'm just going to talk to you for a little while until this kind of calms down. Give me something to focus on. But you're overwhelmed. God gives us that rest. He gives us that rest of our emotions. But sometimes when we don't do that, when we don't call upon God to help us do that kind of stuff, we try to self-medicate. We try to self-medicate. We try to, to, to take things, put things into our bodies that cause us to go to sleep, to pass out, whether it's drugs or alcohol or what have you. We do that. But guess what happens the next morning? Those thoughts, those emotions, those trials are sitting right there waiting for you, sometimes confounded by a really, really, really bad headache. So your body feels like your your body feels bad. Your brain is just swimming with all this stuff instead of just taking it and giving it to God in the beginning, letting Him handle it. Because one of the things that we have to understand is that the God that we serve, the God of Abraham, is bigger than all of our circumstances. It's bigger than anything that we'll ever come up against. He's there. He's got it. He's going to take care of it. But we have to give it over to him and let him work it. You know, in the midst of all the chaos that we have going on all the time now, in the midst of all the trials, God says we can still have rest. God says we can still sleep soundly whenever the enemy is at the gate beating the door down, trying to get in and trying to attack us. 
perfect example of that is in Acts 12, verses 4 through 7. Now, the disciples had just heard that, bless you, they had just heard that James had been killed by King Herod. They were running. They were on the run. The guards were tra- chasing them down. They snagged Peter up, threw him in jail. And when they seized him, he put him in prison and handed him over to four, guard, four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. Now, intending to bring him out, guess what that means? They were going to kill him after Passover. While Peter was kept in prison, pay attention to this, the church prayed fervently to God for him. He had people praying for him. That's how we can rest when we're going through all these trials. The very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter bound with two chains was sleeping between two soldiers while guards in front, bless you, in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and woke him. He woke Peter up. Peter was asleep. He knew that his number was fixing to be called the very next day. But he still slept. He said, get up quickly, and the chains fell off his wrist. Man. Mm. Even when we are struggling with all these things that we've got going on in our lives, even though that we've got all this stuff, you know, we've got the devil beating us up over something, we are struggling, we're trying, we're trying to do the best we can, we can still rest spiritually because God said it was able to be done. This isn't just somebody's, you know, rendition of what possibly happened. This is what happened to Peter. Peter was asleep. He knew that God's will was bigger than the situation he was in. It doesn't matter. Peter didn't, it didn't matter to Peter whether he lived or died at that point. Peter knew that he was doing the will of God. And if that was God's will for him to die in that prison, then that was God's will. And he was okay with that. He still slept. Many times we walk around with all these burdens and stuff on us and pretending everything's okay. We're we're afraid to tell people what we're going through. We're we're too proud to ask for help. I know I'm talking to somebody in here if it's just me. I'm preaching to myself more more than anybody else this morning. I'm going to tell you that right now. But you don't have to tell everybody your business, even though a lot of people do that. Facebook, Y'all need to quit putting stuff on Facebook. I'm telling you, not y'all in particular, but society needs to quit putting all their dirty laundry out there. I don't care. I don't, if you need prayer or something, you need, need some help with something, let me know. I don't need to know all the details, and I, don't, I just don't, I don't need to know it. Just we'll leave it at that. Mm, oversharing is a real thing. But you need to have at least a small group of people inside of the body of Christ that can pray and help guide you through that stuff which is I'm blessed to be able to do that here. We have all these things. Like Not everybody knows everything about everybody, but there's enough to know just enough to help with that intercessory prayer. Did you know that resting was a commandment from God? You should. You should. You should. It's actually commandment number four. Number four. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 10, Moses said, the Sabbath day, uh, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Yeah, my copy-paste got rid of some of that stuff there, but that's fine. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. Nobody does any work on the Sabbath. That is one day throughout the week to rest. Not everybody can rest on Sundays. I get it. Not everybody can rest on a Saturday. I got it. I used to have to work every Sunday. Did that for a very long time. But there needs to be a day during the week where you rest. You have to rest. You have to rest. It may not be the entire day you take off and do that, but you need to spend time Resting in the presence of God. It's not just sitting back on the boat fishing and, you know, drinking and hanging out and doing all kinds of stuff. It's not that. It's when you spend quality time in the presence of God. 
in the presence of God. That is a very important thing because how many times do we take days off from work but we actually don't rest during that day off? <laughs> we're taking somebody to the doctor. We're going to the doctor or we got, you know, we're going on vacation or we're getting pre prepared for a vacation or coming back from a vacation or we've got all this stuff. I'm taking a day off from work just so I can get stuff done at the house I haven't been able to do because I've been doing everything else. that I probably don't need to be doing because I didn't ask God for direction on that and I hadn't done this and I haven't spent time with God to find out what it is He wants me to do. But yet I've been too busy to get all this other stuff done. I want to ask you a question. Do you know why? One of the reasons why. It's one of the reasons is obvious. But do you know another reason why God created Adam and Eve on the sixth day of creation? I didn't create them on the fifth or the fourth. Couldn't go back any further than that because there wasn't anything to put them on. There was no ground. But do you know why he did that? One of the reasons why he did that? We'll read Genesis 2, verses 2 through 3. It says, On the sixth day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because it was because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Here's a reason why God created Adam and Eve on the sixth day. It's so that the very first thing they would experience on this earth was day seven, a day of rest in the presence of their creator. Think about that. If, they'd, if he'd have created them earlier in the, in the creation, then all they would have seen whenever they came to was God working and doing and being busy and all this kind of stuff. But he, they created, he created them on the day prior to his work being complete. And so that when they, they their first day, first real full day on this planet, they could rest in the presence of God. That's very important. I don't want you to miss that. We're so busy being busy. We're so busy worshiping the idol of busyness. It is an idol because it's something we put many times before God, being busy, doing work, doing things. That, that busyness is something that comes between us and God, so that in, in and of itself is, is an idol. The devil wants to rob you of all the blessings because whenever you do not rest, you miss the blessings that God has in store for your life. Because you're not able to see those things. You can't slow down long enough to see what's right in front of you, to see what happens. Look at what Moses said over in Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 6. said, If you will only obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments that I'm commanding you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall be you in the city. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, the fruit of your livestock, both the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket, be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed, blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. We miss those blessings. We miss those provisions that God has set aside for us. Which is brings me to my second point this morning. Rest gives us provision. God has a provision. God has blessings set aside for us when we do what he's told us to do, which is number four on the list, rest. We were created to do what? Depend upon God. We were not created to be independent. We were created to be unique, but not independent apart from God. Even though the culture of the day, society tells us that you have to be independent. You don't need to rely on anybody else or nothing else. You do you, boo-boo. I don't know why I just said that. <laughs> and it's recorded too. So it's on the YouTube. It's going to go forever. But anyway, but anyway, that's what society is telling us to do. The society says that you have to be independent. You don't need to rely on anybody else. And God said that's not accurate. You were created to live in a community to rely on one another and ultimately rely on God for his provision for your life. That's what we were created for. But the devil knows that if he can get us alone, he can put that 
that little seed of doubt in our head and said, you know what, you don't really need God. You don't need to deal with all this stuff. You can just do all this stuff on your own. You can do all of it on your own. Listen to what uh, Moses said in Leviticus 25, verses 1 through 4. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land that I am giving you, the land shall observe a Sabbath for the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in the field. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of complete rest for the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. So, command to the Israelites, six and one. One year of rest for your field. Now, we know how that turns out, but we'll get to that in a second. But why did God do that? Why did God give them a command before the promise? Why did God give them the command? Because Moses never made it into the promised land. Well, that's what he was talking about. He was talking about when you guys get to the promised land, this is how you're supposed to Conduct your fields and your vineyards. Six years on, one year off. And as a matter of fact, the entire one generation of the people wandering around in the wilderness never made it to the promised land. But why did God do that? Why did God give them the command before the promise? Because he was trying to set apart the Israelites. He was trying to strengthen up their faith before he was given the promise. The same thing applies to us. There's many times where we have to build up our faith. We have to build up our faith, our reliance on God before he gives us the promise that he's told us he was going to give us. And a lot of the problems we face spiritually and physically is because we do not and cannot slow down. We can because sometimes we are forced to. Some God God gets our attention one way or the other and we have to slow down. He's done that to me more than once. I'm sure he's done the rest of y'all out the same way. We're going to talk about the year of Jubilee real quick. In uh, Leviticus 25, verses 8 through 11, he said, You shall count off seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the period of seven weeks of years gives us 49 years. I know there's a lot of math, and I never really did understand. That always made my head hurt. But anyway, so every seventh year, you take the day off. Well, when you do that seven times, that's 400, or 49 years. So the 49th year... You don't plant anything. Well, guess what happens after that? Then you shall have the trumpet sounded loud on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. You shall have the trumpet sounded throughout all your land, and you shall hallow the fiftieth year, and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all of its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. You shall return every one of you to your property and every one of you to your family. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. You shall not sow or reap the aftergrowth or harvest of the unpruned vines. So not only were you not planting the 49th year, but you also weren't planting the 50th year. So they were counting on the, the, way, it's, the way it's laid out. God was going to provide them for three years worth of provisions off of the sixth year. I know, follow me, just... Just trust me. I did the math last night. I was like, yeah, okay, it counts. It, it works out. So basically what that scripture is saying, and I, the, some of this other stuff not in your outline, but I, I kind of had to cut it out just for time's sake. But the year of Jubilee, the 50th year, every 50 years, everybody returns back to their homes. All the debts are paid. People, the slaves are removed from bondage. Land is returned back to their rightful owners. Because everybody was given, all the 12 tribes were given land that was theirs forever in the promised land. That was given to them. Everybody had a plot of land. So when they come back to, for the year of Jubilee, that land was returned back to them like it was supposed to be. But they couldn't plant for the 49th year. They couldn't plant and reap and harvest for the 50th year. So what did God have to do? God had to provide on the 48th year to span until the 51st year. Because you can't plan on the 50th, so you can't, you're not going to get anything on the 51st year. It's a lot of weird stuff, but that was a special blessing that God had set up for the year of Jubilee. God was going to provide it. If they trusted Him, if they trusted God, if they trusted for His provision, He would provide for them for three whole years off of one year's harvest. Does everybody follow me on that? I'm, I'm losing some of you. Just trust me. The math works. You can read it. You can go through Leviticus 25 and read it and study it. I, I, I want you to do that. So what happened? 
They didn't do that. They didn't do any of that. They started to, to focus on their own hands, their own works, their own things. They, they, didn't, they didn't follow the guidelines for the Sabbath year of, of the thing. They didn't follow the guidelines for the Jubilee. They had the party. They had the party for the Jubilee. But they did not adhere to the rest of the land. They didn't let the land rest the way it was supposed to. They didn't let the land recover from what Because if you plant the same thing over and over again on the same plot of land... <laughs> Without any extra fertilizer, you're going to eventually stop getting any crops because the nutrients are going to be gone out of that ground. So you had to give it rest, give it time for the nutrients to come back. So what happens? We know what happens. It leads them to bondage. Well, guess how many years they were in bondage for? Seventy years. Babylon took hold of them. Well, guess what? You do the math, 70 times 7 is what, 490 years. So for 490 years, they did not observe the Sabbath on their field. They didn't observe the rest for the land of Jubilee. God forced them to let that land rest. God didn't give them a choice. God removed them from the land completely and let it lay barren and hallowed for 70 years. That's how important rest is. That's how important following God's commandments are. It's not just about, oh, now we gotta, you know, we gotta, we've got to just let this land lay fallow for, or fallow for a year. No, you're trusting in God's provision. He said he's going to provide for you. You have to trust in his provision. It's about faith. And the Israelites had zero most of the time until they were flat on their back and had no choice but to talk to God about it. My final point, we're, we're wrapping up, we're almost there. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Rest gives us freedom. Rest gives us freedom. Luke verse four, or chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, this is what Jesus is saying, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are opposed, oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What is that? The year of the Lord's favor. You know what that is? It's the year of Jubilee. Jesus was the Jubilee. Jesus is the freedom from bondage, the freedom from debt, the freedom from burdens, the debts that we can't pay. Jesus is the place that we get rest. So now we're finally going to get to my trash bag stuff here. So we walk around with all this stuff, walking around spiritually, spiritual baggage we walk around like in this all the time. We walk into church this way. We walk in everywhere. We go, hey, man, how you doing, Brother Victor? You doing good today? Man, yeah, I'm doing good. Everything is perfectly fine. I love it. Everything is great. No problems here. No problems here. Guys, you guys doing all right over there? Yeah? Everybody good? I, can't. I ain't got time. I, I, man, I love to help you. I don't have time. I got all this stuff going on. I got all these things. All these things I got to do. All this stuff we put on us, we put on ourselves, talked about this morning earlier that God didn't put there for us. God didn't tell us to do it, bless you. But I, I you know, I, I really want to, I got to spend time with my family. I got to call my family. I don't, I don't, I got so much stuff to do. I got so much stuff I got going on and I, I can't, I don't have time and I'm going to have to skip church tonight and I, I don't have time to go to church. I, I can't, I don't, I'm so busy. I ain't even got time to read God's word. I don't have time to do my devotions. I don't have the time to study. I don't have the time to do any of that stuff. None of it. I've got all these, all these burdens i got on me. I've got all this stuff that I'm trying to do. I don't have time, God. I don't have time, Mama. I don't have time, Jaden, Noah. I can't do all that. I'm too busy. I've got all this stuff i got to do. We come in here every Sunday. 
just like this, spiritually burdened. We can't, we just, we, just, we, we don't have time. We don't, we have put so much stuff on our plate. I've got schedules at work to, for my boss. I can see his calendar and outlook, and it is absolutely ridiculous. There is zero free time. He's got 30 minutes for lunch. That's about it. He's in meetings all the time. But he walks, you know, we walk around with all this stuff that we, and a lot of it's self-imposed a lot of times. He doesn't say no. He doesn't like to say no. But we got, we got all this stuff that we're doing. We got all these things that it, 90% of it doesn't matter. That actually got really heavy. <laughs> I'm starting to break my wrist a little bit. Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary, carrying heavy burdens. I will give you rest. But we say, no, God, I can't. I, I got too much things to do. He said, I told you to drop it. Shut it off. Turn it off. Sit down. Let me do what you can't do. Let me do. He knows all of this stuff. He knows what we've got going on in our lives. He knows what we're dealing with. All he wants is you to ask for his help. Sit down for a minute. Talk to him. Pray. Tell, thank him for everything. We are so busy. For no reason many times. We've got so much going on in our brains. And most of it doesn't even need to be there. It needs to be in these trash bags. 90% of it needs to be in the trash bag. But when we lay it all down at the foot of that cross, don't pick it back up and walk back out the door with it. We do that every single day. I've had this illustration in my head, and I've said to, I've mentioned it a few times. Um, one of the ladies at work, she's got a prayer box, and she was reading this devotion about the prayer box. She said, "You take your little things that you have problems with, and you put them in that box. And if you don't trust God with it, you pick it up, take it out. If you don't think He's going to take care of it, and that hit me like a ton of bricks. If I can't trust God to fix what I asked Him to fix," then I just take that right back out of the box. I've got to find somebody else to work on it for me. That is exactly where we are. We want to take that prayer back out of that box and handle it ourselves. We, don't want to tr we can't trust God with it because we don't trust his timing. We, don't, we want it done right now, and we can't wait. We have zero patience. If we don't see a way out of it, we want to just pick it right, but we're going to pick this mess right back up, and we're going to walk right out the door with it again. And we're going to carry this around until finally something's going to break. We're eventually going to just wear out, drop. Has anybody ever been, uh, I don't know what the medical term for it is now, but to basically burn out? You've been to the doctor, you can't figure out what's wrong with you, and they said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I do this. I said, well, do you ever take any time to rest? They're like, well, no, not really. I said, you're burnt out. Your blood pressure's through the roof. You're, you know, you've got pains and stuff all over the place. Young people, you'll figure it out later when you get a little bit older. It's going to happen. Trust me. When we take time to rest, when we take time to turn all of this junk over to God and let him get rid of what needs to be gotten rid of and help us in the places where we need help, we can rest. Jesus said, I'll take care of it. God commanded that we take a rest. We don't have to do it all ourselves. We don't have to be independent. We can be codependent. We can be interdependent. But we have to turn these things over to God and let him do the heavy lifting. You take your hands off of it. God said, let go. Let it go. What was it we talked about this morning in Sunday school? Be still and know that I am God. As Wendy comes to play our closing song this morning, 
If you've got some burdens that you need to let turn over to Jesus, let God take care of it. Don't carry it out the door with you. Don't leave this church with that burden. It doesn't matter what it is. You give it to God. You let God take care of it. You let God drive with it. Take your hands off the wheel. Let God drive. Everybody's like, Jesus is my co-pilot. No, Jesus should be your pilot. You need to be bound up in the trunk most of the time so you don't get in the way. <laughs> Let him do what he's got to do. Let God do what he's supposed to do, what he wants to do. Stand and sing, page 424. Take the name of Jesus with you. If you have a need this morning, please, let's do it. y'all for being here this morning and we got layman league and auxiliary tonight at six we got children's choir practice at five so bring your youngins out here let them let them sing we're working on some camp songs we're going to do for a special out here so it's going to be it's going to be good and they they get tore up now they, they're ready to go they're ready to sing and have a good time and then we got bible study on wednesday night so just uh, be much in prayer for everything we got going on and and uh, but just pray for one another because it's, it's important that we keep each other lifted up. So whenever we're in our prisons, you know, we got our stuff going on like Peter did. We got people in the back praying for us. And then that Holy Spirit can come over there and lift up, say, wake up. It's time to go. We're out of here. Then chains fall off. Prayer makes chains fall off. Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. It's kind of gracious, Heavenly Father, Lord. We just thank you again for your blessings in this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house again, Father. And we just bless us now as we depart from here. Keep us, uh, keep us covered with your love, your grace, and your mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen.